Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're at the Battleship Texas in LaPorte, Texas. This has been the ship's home for the last almost 80 years, and may not be soon, as the ship is planning to move probably somewhere else in the greater Houston-Galveston area. Today, we're gonna talk about the weird shape of Battleship Texas. I don't think it's particularly weird having grown up building models of Arizona and the other standard type battleships. However, one of the comments I've heard about the ship in the brief time I'm here is, wow, she looks shorter, she looks fatter, she looks like she's got these weird ridges and bumps on them. And why was the ship designed like that? Battleship New Jersey, admittedly, has an extremely smooth, sleek look about her. And I can say a lot of great things about Texas, but uh, I cannot say that she is smooth or sleek looking. So why did the designers of this ship, or who incorporated these elements for no less reason than the designers of New Jersey incorporated theirs, uh, choose the weird crenellated look for this ship. Oh, I don't quite know where to, where to start. Uh, first off, Battleship Texas is uh, just about the same width as an Iowa-class battleship at 108 feet wide. However, she's more than 250 feet shorter, so it is a much lower length to beam ratio. Why did they choose to go with such a dumpy ship? First of all, that wasn't the initial choice. The ship was initially significantly narrower than that, and during the interwar period, they added blisters to the side of the ship, which uh, if you look about halfway down the hall, you see a line going all the way around. Those are torpedo blisters added to the side to add additional fuel storage and torpedo defense to protect the ship. As designed, torpedoes were not as dangerous to battleships as they were within a couple of years of her service life. And so the post-World War I additions had to make the ship wider, but added depth to the torpedo defense. Why did they go with a short, dumpy ship? Well, the ship wasn't designed for speed like an Iowa-class battleship. The Navy had cruisers to do the fast scouting work, although admittedly not enough. The US Navy is always chronically short in cruisers during this period. The battleships are supposed to be a slow, but homogeneously speeded unit that operate together in a line. They don't need high speed, so most of the American battle line is designed to be about 21 knots. So you don't need a really high length to beam ratio to achieve high speed when you're operating in that battle line. The Iowas are the exception to this. Moreover, the Iowas with their long, narrow features tend to be a less stable gun platform than other contemporary ships because of, of the rocking and rolling that happens. Whereas Texas's more square form makes her an extremely stable gunnery platform. How about the bow next? There's a whole heck of a lot going on at the bow. Believe it or not, while ships a generation or two older might have been done by gut feeling and with artistic license, by Texas's time, there is hard science going into the design of these ships, uh, especially in the bow. A naval officer by the name of Taylor comes up with the Taylor bow, where he figures out using tank tests that a wide bow on a large ship like this helps break up the waves that the ship is cutting through, and it uh, actually makes the ship more efficient at its cruising speeds and above. We've done a video on this before. There's a link in the description below. So the ship has an almost ram-like bow on there that, that gets really bulbous below the waterline and then comes in and in to be pretty narrow where it is breaking the surface tension of the water. And then it curves out again at the top. So this has made us hydrodynamically efficient, but they're also worried about water coming over the top. This ship 
being significantly shorter than an Iowa-class battleship, has a way shorter foc'sle. There, there is practically nothing in front of the gun turrets. So waves breaking over there uh, are where the crew are. With older battleships like this, they didn't want to do the curved upward bow of an Iowa-class battleship. They wanted the guns to be able to fire at zero degrees elevation. Battle ranges were not expected to be all that significant. And when your guns can only elevate 15 degrees, you need all of those degrees, zero to 15. Uh, it can't be like an Iowa-class battleship where our guns can elevate to 45 degrees. And uh, if we can't depress beyond two degrees or three degrees firing bow on, oh no, we can still shoot at targets 23 miles away. Uh, not so with Texas. So they had to make the, the main deck flush. And so they have it curving out and, and getting this real round shape so that waves breaking up are gonna hit the underside of that and go down rather than breaking over the top of it. Next, let's get to these weird crenellations along the side of the ship. This is something that you see uh, with most of the dreadnoughts and standard type battleships, and not just for the United States, around the, uh, the world during this time period. It's very, very common to see your secondary battery, your anti-torpedo boat battery, which on an American standard type battleship are five inch 51s, uh, mounted in the hull during this time. So that that first deck down, what we would call second deck on, on Battleship New Jersey, the designers of Texas called the gun deck. Like it's a freaking 1700 sailing ship. That's where the anti-torpedo boat battery is. Uh, and they very specifically designed the sponsons down there so that these secondary guns would have the greatest possible training arcs so they could engage torpedo boats all around the ship, bow on and so forth. They couldn't be directly at the bow because remember those waves breaking over, uh, when those ports are open for the guns, it is this huge open rectangle. Uh, and there are in theory some, some interlocking sheet metal things that could slide there and there were some canvas covers that could be there, but they always leaked. So you gotta have it a little bit far after you gotta then make these weird cutouts particularly along that second deck area for these things to be able to get their best arcs of fire. Now, even though two or three of the earliest generations of dreadnoughts and almost all the pre-dreadnoughts featured guns in these positions, when we actually went to war and started fighting in the North Atlantic during World War I, it was very quickly realized that there are some pretty nasty waves there and those come right through those open gun ports. And what's on the other side of those open gun ports, that's where the crew sleeps and eats and spends all their free time. So now that area is damp and moldy and they're trying to sleep and North Atlantic waves are coming in and hitting them in their hammocks. Uh, so it, it's just frigidly cold. The ship's got no climate control as built, uh, nothing significant at least. So the Navy takes pity on their humble, humble sailors and figures out, hey, these guns aren't actually usable down here anyway. If we move them up one level to the deck house on main deck, boom, they function a heck of a lot better and it's not letting in all the elements. And so that's why you have that feature there and a lot of the other weird shapes around the hall. So what's another weird design feature where, where you look at a battleship and you're like, why in the heck is that like that? Let us know in the comment section down below. Maybe we'll cover it in a future video. Do you think all of these weird design features have legitimate uses? Do, do you think the designers had good reasons for doing things the way they did? Uh, or, or do you think, looking back at it with hindsight, that it was absolutely absurd for them to make a slow battleship or put the guns one deck lower? Let us know your thoughts about Battleship Texas's design in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. If you're looking to support a museum ship, consider donating to the Battleship Texas Foundation. We've left a link for their donate page in the description below. It will support them in their major year-long dry docking effort that's, that's going to start hopefully midway through 2022. You can support Battleship New Jersey by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about our museum and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.